Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features What If number 28, cover dated August 1981. And the cover here by Frank Miller, inked by Klaus Janssen, highlights the story What If Daredevil Became an Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. And the second story, What If Ghost Rider Were Separated from Johnny Blaze. But this is a weird switcheroo because in the issue itself, Daredevil is a backup story and the Ghost Rider story is the main story. And what's happened here, I feel, is that time has passed from when Frank Miller did the 12-page story, probably as an inventory filler story for a future issue of What If. But in this uh, time period, or in the subsequent time period, Darede he's taken over Daredevil as writer-artist with issue 168, introducing Elektra. And in the subsequent months, the success of the title has seen it move from being bi-monthly to monthly and the sales on the title are going up and Daredevil is becoming a much more popular character under the creative pen of Frank Miller. And now Daredevil, that inventory story, has top billing on the cover here by Frank Miller. And it's a really well-designed cover. I like it. It's eye-catching. I like the directionality of the pose of Daredevil there, shadowing young Matt as an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. taking out Hydra agents. And then Frank Miller just sticking in a little bit of uh, Ghost Rider at the bottom of the page. So let's open this one up to, oh, by the way, in August of uh, 1981, what else would have been on comics, newsstands and uh, racks would have been Daredevil issue 173. So that's just to give you a sense of what else was on the racks in that particular month. Now I'm going to skip ahead to the uh, Daredevil story. That is what I'm interested in here. Just get to the start of it. These pages are quite thin. Um, and yeah, here we go. So this is a 12 page story. The creative team down here, Mike W. Barr and Frank Miller credited as writer, co-plotters, penciler. So Barr um, co-plotting with Miller this story and writing the script. And my guess is that Frank Miller was probably up at the Marvel offices in 1980 and um, hunting around for some work and maybe got to talking with uh, Mike Barr for an idea uh, for a what if story regarding Daredevil. And this is the product of that. So with every what if story, you get Iwatsu, the watcher, um, introducing the concept of there being um, for reality, not a single simple pathway stretching from the past into the future, but a complex road with a nigh infinite number of forks in its course. So what if Matt Murdock had not become Daredevil? What if instead he became Matt Murdock, Adoc, um, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D.? So this is our story concept. The rest of the creative team there, Klaus Janssen, Inker, Joe Rosen, Letterer, and Glynis Wine, Colorist. So the usual creative team of um, Daredevil um, after Miller took over as writer artist. And so here on this particular page, we get a rerun of Matt's familiar origin, promising his father that he wouldn't get into fighting, that he would study, and uh, become somebody who works with his mind, not his back, somebody important like a doctor or a lawyer. So Matt makes the promise, and then on that fateful um, day, he sees the old man crossing the road with the truck, careering towards him he pushes the old man out of the way and then the radioactive isotope gets in his eye and blinds him and Iwatu says with young Matt using his athletic skill the skill he developed by training secretly to avoid his father's wrath to save the life of another however not all worlds end up with the boy becoming a costume crime fighter let us see now a single divergent factor, how a single divergent factor can cause a world of difference. So what is it going to be? Well, this is intriguing. It turns out that a young industrialist of genius stature decided on a hunch to follow his company's truck on its peril fraught route. And who does that turn out to be? Except for a young Tony Stark. And he sees what's happened. And he says, the boy needs help. Get another man, sergeant. So off goes the sergeant. Put him in the back of my car, boys. Nice and easy now. 
Um, why your car, Mr. Stark, an ambulance could get him to a hospital faster? Not the hospital I have in mind, boys. So Stark's um, hover car um, goes up into the air and up to the shield helicarrier. Um, but he's being watched. He's being observed by an agent of Hydra who calls in regarding the boy. And minutes later, in a newly completed helicarrier, miles above the earth, Tony Stark confers with Colonel Nick Fury, the recently appointed director of S.H.I.E.L.D., America's foremost espionage agency. So there's a little bit of an argument implied between Stark and, um, and Fury regarding whether it was a mistake to bring the boy there. And Fury responds to Stark, I ain't saying nothing of the kind, Stark, and you know it. It's just that I got enough troubles getting S.H.I.E.L.D. operational without any more worries. So now we see the boy in a sensory deprivation tank. And when I see the images here, and I like the way that Miller um, orientates uh, Matt's body um, around um, in the drawing. So he's upside down, then he's um, horizontal, and then he's um, going diagonal in this one. So it gives you a sense of his disorientation in the sensory deprivation tank. I like Joe Rosen's lettering here as well for all the sounds that Matt is able to hear with his newly enhanced hearing. And um, Tony says, I thought the radiation might have affected him somehow, but, and then Nick Fury interrupts, you did good Stark. Okay, so Stark has come around now, bringing the kid up here from here on, it's up to us. And Stark says, I'm not sure I like the sound of that, Nick. And Fury says, as he lights the cigarette there, or rather his cigar, the kid could be the best secret agent the world's ever seen, Stark. It's my job to make sure he joins us and not the bad guys. You mean Hydra, asked Stark? Yeah, those jokers want to conquer the whole blamed world. But look at the art here. Really good stuff from Miller. Um, we've got Stark and Fury in silhouette. And then when Fury lights his cigar with the match, we get the lighting illuminating their faces. Really good stuff. And Matt spinning around on screen in the sensory deprivation tank. So now that Fury's um, alert to the fact that Matt's been changed by the radioactive isotope, um, he wants him on the S.H.I.E.L.D. team. And the mention of Hydra is uh, a cue for a scene shift to Fogwell's gym where a nice top-down shot there of uh, Matt's father battling Jack Murdoch, um, training in the gym with the punching bag there, tapping away at it, and then he hears footsteps. Matt, that you, son, he asks as he turns his head. Nice lighting there on the head as well. Good use of colouring there by Glynis Oliver as well for the double, double lighting and shadow on Battling Jack's face. And it looks like Matt's there, except it isn't. And notice too, how for this particular panel, just to vary the layout on the page, Miller has pulled out the panel um, borders so we have an open panel for this and it's not mad at all it's a life model decoy um, a hydra one and it's been used in order to kidnap or abduct Matt's father so then the scene shifts to the heli carrier again that's another good drawing of the heli carrier by the way I just want to say I really like the implication of scale there we've got the uh, jet plane um, in front of the heli carrier, heli carrier so that really gives us a sense of its immense size so in the carrier we've got a Dr. Frost and she's examining um, Matt and she um, discovers taking the bandages off his eyes that um, he's blind and he discovers it too so we've a moment of emotional trauma there and we've got Glynis Oliver's uh, trope of coloring in such moments in red so we see Matt there, he's um, um, aghast, and Fury tells him, take it easy, kid. It ain't, a, it ain't as bad as you think. You'll find that out. Other people have been blinded, kid. You ain't the first. We'll help you. And no doubt Fury saw many people blinded in World War II. That's a nice little detail of characterization behind his dialogue, I reckon. And I like that image there of Matt, like most of his face in silhouette, and just the eyes open and crying. Um, and we know he's blind. But um, time passes and he discovers that all his other senses are enhanced. Touch, taste, hearing and smell. And I like the way that that is shown there in those small four panels. 
And so Matt is training um, in some kind of training room on the helicarrier. Nick Fury there on screen telling Matt to take it easy, you're going too fast. And Matt, uh, full of confidence, a daredevil, yes, a man without fear says, what's the matter Fury? Afraid I'll break some of your expensive equipment. So we've got Fury in um, dialogue with Dr. Frost while watching Matt in the training room. And Fury says, will you talk to him, Doc? I don't want him hurt. And she says, he's taking no chances, Colonel. Not only has Matt learned to use his strengthened senses, combining them with his natural athletic abilities, but the radiation also gave him some sort of personal radar, she says. In many ways, he's more capable than any sighted person. So Fury reckons he'd make the best field operative we've ever had. And Matt demonstrates his hypersenses by hearing exactly what Fury was saying. I like the acting here um, in these three panels in Miller's art, it's really good stuff. And another one of those borderless panels here as well, which makes for um, a more interesting, visually speaking, layout on the page. Nice top-down angle here of Fury in, a, in the training room with Matt and making Matt an offer. If you sign up with us, we'll put you through college, train you and take care of you and your dad for the rest of your lives. So Matt's um, listening to the offer. He says, it sounds good, but I just don't know. I'll have to talk it over with my dad. Can I call him? And now the problem is, of course, Fury hasn't told Matt about his father having been abducted and that's a big mistake. So Fury tries to cover and he says, no can do, it would violate security. So Matt insists, let's continue with the story here. This is another great sequence with the punching bag. Um, so Matt is, says to him, I've been in here for over a month. My dad must be worried about me. Just let me talk to him. So Fury keeps lying to Matt, but Matt hears um, Fury's heart um, beating more rapidly and thinks to himself, what does that mean? Sounds almost like a lie detector or wait a minute. So he exclaims to Fury aloud, you're lying. I want the truth now. So Fury gives him the truth. He says, your dad's been captured by Hydra agents. They'll probably use him as bait for you. We're looking for him, but we don't want, we didn't want to worry you. Now, as I said, like, you know, that was a big mistake. Matt's a young boy. He's emotional. Worry me, he asks Fury. He may have been dead for a month and you thought telling me might worry me. And this is a great um, final panel of that sequence where he punches the bag so hard it knocks Fury off his feet onto the ground. Really good stuff. And again, we get the implication of scale here with the jet plane and the heli carrier there. It's really, really good stuff. And um, so Matt says he's, uh, that Fury's lost himself an agent. And then he's in dialogue, in conversation with the doctor, Dr. Frost. And she says to him, I can take you to your father, Matt, but alone. So he's surprised by that. And she says, let's just say I've got contacts on both sides of the fence. I'll take you to, the, to your dad tonight, okay? So Matt says, okay, but look at the smile on her face. So she's a double agent. That night, young Matt and the double agent Frost obtain transportation off the heli carrier as Matt learns his first lesson in the fine art of treason. And that's a really nice panel there. And it... Um, basically is the inspiration for the cover. You see Matt there fighting the um, Hydra agents, but in this case, he's fighting shield agents as he gets off the heli carrier. And let's see, where does he go next? Nice sequence of full horizontal um, panels here on this particular page, a speciality of Miller's. And we get an explanation of what's going on here. Um, the alarm is sounded as Matt uh, leaves the heli carrier on that little helicopter there and he's captured or the craft is captured uh, by these shield vehicles here in a big net but Matt manages to jump through uh, the net nonetheless uh, and Fury calls out blasted idiot kid I ought to let you fall but Shield's got too much invested in you so then after Matt's been rescued from falling to his death Fury chews him out but look how defiant Matt is what kind of fool trick was that, he says. Hydra never let you or your dad go. And Matt responds, at least I was doing something, Fury, not just sitting on my duff. And Fury says, we just found out where your dad's been held. We're going to spring him tonight. I'll make you a deal, Fury says, Matt. And I like the way that Miller switches the camera angle here so that we've got a top-down shot on them. 
And Mac continues, you want me as a shield agent? You got me? Just let me go in and save my dad. So Fury just waves his hands up in, um, in the air in, uh, and gives in and he says, kid, you should have been a lawyer. I like the way that Barr is uh, doing um, Fury's dialogue here. It really does sound like him. A hard bitten, uh, practical guy. Um, and isn't Nick Fury from Brooklyn? I think he is. Um, and then that night, clouds gather across the orb of the moon as though blinding it, a symbolic occurrence. Now, it's a bit on the nose, but I kind of like that as well. It's a bit of fun. And I like the way that Miller shows us the underwater of um, the, uh, the pier. But one lost on these two figures navigating toward a hydra base on the fetid bottom of New York's East River. So it looks like it's Dr. Frost who is bringing Matt into uh, this particular uh, hydra base. Um, but it was all a ruse. So um, the Matt was wearing, wait a second here. Yeah, this was a model. Um, a mannequin, he says, that mannequin fooled him just long enough for me to get close. Now comes the easy part. So they would have thought it was Dr. Frost bringing them um, Matt, but it wasn't. It was a ruse. So a nice little action panel there of him fighting underwater. And then he emerges from the East River into the base. Um, he easily deals with the lock there. And he thinks um, this thing is as hard to open as a safety pen. There they are up ahead. I'll only get one chance at this, so I better do it in style. So we got a nice um, panel here. I'm kind of surprised that Miller didn't do a DeLuca effect here, but it works really well. We have a sense of him bouncing around and taking out all of those Hydra agents and using the guns not to kill them, but to take out the lights because he's blind. He can operate in the dark with his um, hypersenses and radar sense, whereas the, she uh, the Hydra agents don't have that ability. So really nice um, fight choreography in these panels as well. It's good stuff. And then we're told in the narration, but young Matt has underestimated the abilities of his foes and soon, um, and soon he leaves the fight in search for his father and they figure out that that's where he must have disappeared to. Look at poor old battling Jack. Basically they gave him no other clothes than, his, than the boxing shorts that uh, they abducted him, abducted him in that he was wearing when he was abducted. But now they're surrounded. Matt's freed his father so they've got all uh, the muzzles of these guns pointing at them. And look again, Glynis Oliver colours them in red with the implication of impending violence. But Matt says with a big smile on his face, not so fast, fellas. You're the ones who should give up. I've got you surrounded. So they're amused by that. And Matt calls in S.H.I.E.L.D. So here's Fury. Fury doesn't like to just sit back in the heli carrier. He likes to go out on the missions. I like that. So he gives the orders to his S.H.I.E.L.D. team. Let's go, you lunkheads. The kid signal means he needs us. You got the gas ready? So they gas the base, which takes out a lot of the Hydra agents. This guy, though, um, grabs the gas mask from Batlin Jack. Um, and he thinks that grabbing the old man, you're my ticket out. But Batlin Jack now, at this point, having been um, tied up for a month, um, is well ready to uh, uh, throw a punch. And he does. And he knocks the shield guy out with one punch. This bozo couldn't stand two rounds with Mickey Mouse, he says. That's amusing. That's pretty funny. And now we get our wrap-up um, in the final three panels. Not so long after, uh, Fury says, Looks like it all came out in the, in the wash, Murdoch. I got me an agent, and you're set for the rest of your life. So um, Matt replies, Yeah, now I won't have to sign with that... Oh, sorry, not Matt, but his father says, Yeah, now I won't have to sign with that goon, the fixer. But there's one problem, Matt. So that's... A reference to um, a second chapter of Matt's origin story where his father um, signs with the fixer, thro uh, throws some matches but then doesn't throw the title fight and um, the fixer and his friends lose a lot of money betting on that match and then basically they, uh, they shoot Matt's father um, which leads to Matt becoming Daredevil in the costume. Um, so uh, that's not going to happen in this alternative timeline. 
But uh, Batlin Jack asks, what about the promise I made to your mom that you'd become somebody important? So Matt's got an answer to that. But I will be important, Dad. I'll be fighting for freedom all over the world. And besides, no one will know that Matt Murdock is a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. They'll know me only by my code name, a nickname I got when I was a kid, Daredevil. So there you go. The end of that 12 page what if story now really it's only 12 sorry of the 12 pages 10 are devoted to the what if um, scenario I think that we could have got away from um, the splash page and the retelling of the origin there a bit quicker that could have all been done maybe in one page I would say but I guess this is the era, you know, Jim Shooter is editor-in-chief. It's the era of Shooter's principle that every issue could be a reader's first. So maybe the idea is this could be some reader's first encounter with Daredevil as a character. So we have to have the origin story again for the umpteenth time. But this is pretty good stuff from Miller. Um, really good art from him, good storytelling. With the short page count, there isn't really room or space for any big anchor images, but I do like certain sequences. You really get a sense of his um, cinematic storytelling um, style and how well he handles um, fight choreography and action sequences. It's good stuff. So I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on uh, what if issue number 28? What if Daredevil became an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Let me know your thoughts on this in the comments section. If you enjoyed my review and commentary, please like the video on YouTube and share it. It really does help the channel. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.